read the, the blurb, we're focused in one, on one particular element that I think has been a real hot gun item, which is data and the King Street Transit Pilot Project. Um, so, uh, just to quickly say hi, my name is Jesse Coleman. I'll tell you a little bit about our team that we work on uh, in a second. I work on a team called the Big Data Innovation Team. We sit in the Transportation Division. This is Rafael <laughs> Dumont, <laughs> also on the Big Data Innovation Team. Um, so, without further ado, uh, the Big Data Innovation Team is essentially a small data science team that sits within the Transportation Services Division. And we have a very strong focus on building in-house data analytics capacity in the Transportation Division. Um, focus on the words in-house. Um, something that is not always done in government and something that should be done more. Um, so for those who don't really understand the, the City of Toronto landscape, just sort of, it's a massive organization, really convoluted, et cetera. Uh, Transportation Services is essentially responsible for the streets. Um, so it's largely an operating body, an operating agency, uh, but really anything that has to do with what's happening on the streets is Transportation Services. Um, so that includes you know, clearance, road maintenance, uh, traffic signals, uh, street art, uh, street furniture, uh, bicycle lanes, bicycle programs, pedestrian projects. Uh, there's a few things that we're not, so we're not the TPC clearly, so we're not operating transit, but we are, you know, we provide the roads, we provide the infrastructure that they run on to some degree, not the tracks, I guess. Um, and we also don't really do a lot of the sort of longer term planning work. A lot of that happens within the city planning division, the sort of you know, big strategic stuff tends to happen there. Not all of it, but you know, the, the longer term, whether it's like subway planning, all that kind of stuff, that's city planning, and at a regional level, that's Metrolinx. So that's, that's sort of where we sit. Our team specifically sits within what's called the Traffic Management Center. It's sort of one uh, group within our organization. And we're pretty unique. Uh, you know, there isn't really a lot of transportation agencies in North America even that really have this type of uh, data science capability. Um, we hope it's a growing trend, and we see evidence of it in some other cities, and we're trying to sort of build that network, but we are pretty unique. So, three things about our team uh, before I launch into the project. We've got to get the, get the plug-in for what we do here. Um, so, three major missions and objectives of our team. First is doing practical and repeatable analysis of transportation data, and really focusing on automating everything we do. Um, moving out of spreadsheets is really what it boils down to. Um, we have two main focuses when we're talking about the data that we use. One is there's there's a whole bunch of data in the city that is just locked up in, or you know, it's just sitting on people's computers and no one knows what to do with it. So there's an element of our job that is just trying to sort of crack that nut and, and incorporate that work into what we do, or that data into what we do. The second piece is there's a whole, whole slew of different new types of data that have come online even in the past couple of years that really helped transportation engineers and planners uh, understand cities better, so we're trying to crack that nut as well. And the last part is that we build and use free and open source software. Uh, so you can find all of our work on GitHub, and that's great. So there's sort of five main ways where we organize and structure our work in our team. We are focusing, in the interest of time, on one element today, which is how we can use data to evaluate the projects, policies, programs that exist in the city. So that's where the King Street Pilot comes in. Does anyone here not know what the King Street Pilot is at this point in time? Don't be, don't be shy. Uh, so I, I won't I won't go into too much detail on this because you know it's pretty well known what, what's happening on King Street right now. But just to let you know, the basic situation on King Street has been for a long time. There's about 65,000 people a day who ride on a King Street car. It passes through downtown Toronto, which is highly congested, and you know most of the time when it comes to peak periods or rush hours, um, the streetcar is moving at about a walking speed, and that's a problem. Um, it's been a problem that has existed in our city for a long time. We've tried various things to address it, and this is kind of the latest, and this is, I'd say, the boldest step that the city has taken at this point to try to address this challenge. So for those who don't know, you know this is what King Street used to look like come Know, as, as of the beginning of November, uh, you know your standard downtown four-lane street, streetcar tracks down the middle. Uh, the curb lanes you get in most places you can park sort of in off-peak periods. Uh, the rest of the day, or sorry, during peak periods, it's open for it's open for traffic. 
the pilot project looks something like this, uh, where does this thing work? No, that's good. Uh, the streetcar stops have been moved to the far side. There's the curb lane is essentially being occupied by new uses. So the, the there's an expansion of the streetcar stop into that curb lane. There's new public spaces, which are these areas in green. There's pick up and drop off loading delivery areas in blue. And then there's these sort of right turn queue areas where you take a right off the street. And the main restriction now is that when you get onto King Street, you tend you have to get off the King Street the next block. So it's intended to be sort of local access only. You can get in there to make your drop offs, and then you have to take a right at the next light. So that, that's the basic concept. The whole idea is to essentially bring traffic down on King Street to the level where the streetcars can move through uh, fast and reliably. So when it comes to a pilot project, you know, there's three things that come in a pilot project. One is testing, one is measuring, and one is refining. And one of the things that it's important to understand about this project is that it was it was built with the intention of being able to change things on the fly. And you know, it's it's hard to be extremely nimble with, with this type of thing, because you're talking about big hunts of concrete and paint and all that kind of stuff. But the intention of this stuff was built so that you know, the layout of the streets can be reshuffled, designs can be changed along the way as you start to measure it, uh, incorporate more data, and, and, and see what's actually happening when you do something like this. Um, so that's really where we come in. So that's where, where we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about what, what we do. Um, so measuring the pilot. So there's a lot of sort of key fundamental questions that you can think of uh, that need to be answered when it comes to measuring a pilot project. So, you know, number one, you know, if this doesn't happen, then there probably isn't any point to the project, right? So are streetcars moving faster and more efficiently in Toronto? Or on King Street, sorry. Uh, number two, sort of an ancillary impact is, you know, if streetcars are moving faster, that means more, generally more people will want to take them as well. So has ridership on those streetcars also increased as a result of that? Um, there's also these sort of secondary questions if, you know, ridership goes up, where are those people coming from? You know, were they on the King, uh, Queen Streetcar? Were they driving, you know, where did they come from? That question's pretty hard to answer, but we'll try. Um, and then there's this question of how, how is traffic being impacted on parallel streets down, downtown? Um, has it created Carmageddon or not? Um, and then the fourth one is, is really interesting and something that I think you'll see that because of the type of data and the way that we're doing things, we can actually answer a lot of these questions. So can design or operational changes be made that can optimize the performance and minimize <laughs> adverse impacts of that? So this is the sort of testing we're finding. So can we use data to inform how we change the pilot project and make adjustments? And these adjustments can be to traffic signal timings on, on the street, they can be to the actual layouts of the street, et cetera. And then some other really important questions, and the last one is probably the biggest hot button item right now, but so what's the, what's the impact on public life and active transportation downtown? What's the impact on road safety and vulnerable road users? And last but not, definitely not least, is what's the impact on area businesses? So, you know, this is sort of a snapshot of the types of questions that we're being asked to answer as city staff. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we're going about this. Uh, the, the stuff I'm talking about really focuses in a lot more on the sort of first three or four, the, the, like really the traffic impact. So I've got one slide that just touches on some of the other data feeds that we'll have to answer some of these other questions. So if you were to come to me, say, five years ago, or come to the Transportation Services Division five years ago, and say, we're gonna do this, this transit pilot, and we need you to, to um, prepare to write a staff report at the end of that that's gonna you know, talk about how successful the college project was. Um, how would we have done that five years ago? It would have been very different. So this, this is what I'm gonna to contrast to you, sort of the, the old school traditional way of, of doing transportation engineering and planning, and sort of the new way that we're approaching this. So what would have happened uh, probably not even five years ago, two years ago, whatever, is that is that the city would hire contractors, and these contractors would go out and they would count. So, so you, you get a bunch of bodies on the street with with keep, with clickers, keep, uh, cl sorry, clickers and and, and pens and pen papers and all that sort of stuff, and they'd be counting counting traffic. Uh, you put them in intersections. They do what's called turning movement counts in our field, so like rights, left, straights, all this kind of stuff throughout the day, and. Literally, bodies on the street were counted. Uh, sometimes you get high tech and you can put up a camera and you can record it and then you can count from the video footage. But you know, it's still people counted. You know, you want to measure how fast traffic is moving down the street. You know, it's literally engineers 
for students probably, <laughs> in cars with stopwatches, timing how long it takes to get from Prather to Durham, so Richmond Rich, Rich Street, Alley Street, whatever. Um, so this is obviously problematic, right? There's a lot, of, a lot of sort of basic issues with this, and it's you know created problems for, I'd say, all previous major transportation projects in the city. So one, the sample size is awful. Um, so if you ever look at travel times or how people move in cities, it's very variable. You know, a Tuesday in, in November can be 20% different in some metric than the Wednesday for that week, and you don't you don't really know why. You know, there's a lot of just implicit variability in this stuff. Um, so you're you know cherry picking a couple random days before a project, a couple random days after a project. Um, the other thing is um, there just isn't enough analytical capability in these government departments generally. Um, so it's easy to mis make mistakes. All this data gets thrown into spreadsheets. Um, they get sort of sliced and diced, and there's mistakes everywhere. Um, and you know, it's not really anyone. It's no no one's fault. It's just sort of it's just what the capabilities of, of the staff are generally. And but the the reality is that the in house analytical ca capability is just not there. And then what happens? You know, you get to the end of these projects, and the public news media, everyone is sort of climbing over the city, climbing over city staff, like where, where's the numbers, what's the results? You know, it takes a while to turn that around, and then there becomes a sort of perception that city staff is not being transparent. You know, we're not, you know, city staff is in the background fudging the numbers, or, you know, the, the, these kind of conspiracy theories can pop up. And, you know, that's, that's not the reality, it's just city staff are overstrapped and don't have the resources to really handle this type of analysis. So, so that sort of brings me to the new way of doing things and what we've managed to implement for this pilot project. So a couple things. One is embracing new sensing technologies so that we can be measuring stuff on the fly. And this means permanent and pervasive data feeds of travel times and volumes of people downtown. Um, and and we, you know, we started looking at this and the, the amount of money you spend on this type of stuff really isn't that different from, from going and hiring armies of people to do this sort of manual data collection also. Um, so you, so that money that you're putting isn't really throwaway anymore, it's, it's actually building capability or build, building capacity f to measure future projects as well. Um, everything that you do in terms of like building up a data pipeline and doing your analytics can be automated and made open source. Um, and by having in-house data science capability, you're able to leverage that to pull off a project like this. Um, and then, you know, the, at the end, share openly and actively through open data portals and public dashboards. So, so that's our sort of vision for the, I'd say, the more modern approach to transportation analysis and so on. So I'm just going to talk you through a few of the, the types of data that we're tracking on this project. I'm going to pass it over to Raph after that, who's going to talk a little bit about the reporting side, the sort of dashboards that we've been building, and how we're going to be pushing out this data. Uh, number one, most people here know this, but you know, all streetcars and buses in the city of Toronto are tracked by GPS, so this is nothing new that we've done, but we're working with TTC to pull out a whole bunch of metrics about you know, how fast the streetcars are moving, how much, how the bunching is looking, et cetera, et cetera, from streetcar GPS. So something that is newer is, you'd have to have a keen eye for this, but we've put up a whole bunch of cameras downtown. Uh, so what this looks like, we call them permanent video-based counters, and at 32 intersections downtown, we have fisheye cameras that are mounted sort of at the top of traffic poles. And that video feeds into essentially what, they, what we call a video analyzer box. It's a GPU unit that's sitting in the traffic signal control cabinet. And that video is being processed in real time, converted into turning movement counts. So we're counting bicycles, pedestrians, uh, cars, trucks, transit vehicles, and all the sort of movements they make through an intersection. So we have this at 32 intersections downtown. So just, so just to give you an idea of what it looks like, it's sort of um, something like this. this. This one is not actually counting the pedestrians, but the stuff that we have is. Um, I think this is King and Jarvis, if I remember. And so it's a company called MyoVision. It's a Waterloo-based company that, that provides us with this technology. And it's cool stuff. Um, this is where we have these cameras downtown, so we essentially have them on Bathurst, Spadina, Bay, and Jarvis uh, from Queen down to front, and then every signalized intersection on King Street through the pilot area. So that's a lot of data. 
Uh, number two, Bluetooth readers. So these are sensors that we place also sort of in a grid downtown, and what they're doing is they're uh, sniffing out for Bluetooth map or for MAC addresses of devices as people move around downtown. And essentially what these things do is they can identify a Bluetooth MAC address within about a 100 meter range. Uh, those MAC addresses are hashed to protect privacy. And then, you know, as you see one, one device ID pass, you know, say Spadina, then get over to Bathurst, you can track a travel time based on the timestamps. Uh, so we have a pretty big grid of these things. And they're all across downtown. Uh, so, so this stuff sort of goes from Ron's sales over to Broadview, uh, the Gardner up to Olive Street. And you know the nice thing is because they have a grid of them too, you can sort of see how people are snaking their way through the network, you know, how their how their routes or paths are, are diverting through the city. So also a great data source. And then and the nice thing is that they uh, you know we're we're capturing sort of in the order of ten percent ish of of vehicles in downtown Toronto. So you know you have a nice solid sample, so you can actually report on like the travel time in an hour uh, this morning, for example. So that, so that pretty much covers it for the like the bigger investments in, in data capabilities. There's a bunch of other stuff that's being collected at the same time that I'll just breeze through and then I'll pass it over to Raf. Uh, TTC ridership is obviously an interesting one. Uh, that's a tricky one to collect right now, uh, but TTC is working on that. Uh, point of sale transaction data is one of the data sources that's going to be very important. Uh, essentially, this is this is from Moneris or some of, so some other vendors that. You know, track sales through the you know interact machines essentially. Um, so this is to answer questions of like how was how are sales in the King Street core compared to the greater downtown area to answer some of these questions about you know the impact on businesses. So very hot button. Uh, we're looking at parking data, additional pest, pedestrian data, uh, queue observation sizes for like traffic engineers, uh, collisions, and there's actually a research study out of U of T right now that's doing a lot of extensive work around air quality and noise, and they've also deployed a bunch of sensors on that as well. So, data, data, data. Not final thought, it's a public dashboard. So to reiterate what um, Jesse said before, um, we're trying, or our mission is to have a transparent workflow. Um, and so, we, <clears throat> We want kind of every step of our process for evaluation and monitoring to be transparent and open. So eventually all the data that we've been using in our analyses that we can open will be open. We'll try to open it at a, as disaggregate a level as possible. Um, and then we will show how we've been processing this data and aggregating it up. And then um, we've been doing all of our analyses um, for the most part in uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So um, the public or other interested parties can kind of use the same data that we've used, process it the same way, and then follow along our code for why we're using particular metrics and even you know, reproduce the exact same graphs or plot. Um, and we're also developing open source dashboards, uh, one internally and the other externally or for the public. So our internal dashboard um, has been focused on uh, making sure that Carmageddon doesn't happen. So we've been monitoring parallel streets to um, King uh, immediately after the pilot went in place and comparing travel times by time period um, to a baseline period um, before the pilot um, was put into effect. So we have morning, afternoon, uh, or sorry, morning, midday, PM peak, and then weekday and weekend. Um, and that's been uh, released to kind of senior management and other internal stakeholders within the city. And we got this out very quickly and have been kind of iterating over it. So this, the first edition was just parallel streets to King. The second edition also includes north-south streets. Um, so perpendicular streets because people who are turning off of King could be causing a lot of traffic on you know, Bathurst, Spadina University, et cetera. Um, and then we have a version three that's still in the works um, so that the user can kind of look at um, different periods of time. At the moment, this is just fixed to be the last two weeks uh, to show that like nothing's happened, but 
Um, now someone can really compare like holiday break versus December versus back to school in January. Uh, and for those interested, this is entirely um, developed using Dash, um, which is a Python dashboarding framework, and it's fully open source, and uh, very easy to deploy onto Heroku. Um, and you may have seen this. Um, we have been releasing ongoing reports on how the network is performing to the public, what I would like to call a public dashboard format. It is not particularly interactive, um, but it's been an aggregation of all the metrics that um, Jesse has been talking about. So these are the streetcar metrics. These are the car metrics. Um, we didn't do this layout, but laid out with a graphics person internally. And, um, but behind the scenes, we have been working on creating uh, an interactive piece to this. So we would like to demonstrate the uh, changes in traffic volumes in the area uh, before and after. Don't look too closely at anything on this because it's all fake data. <laughs> um, but this is to demonstrate uh, the interactivity of seeing kind of how the volumes change month by month uh, and change between the AM and the PM peak, and if you mouse over, you'll see um, kind of the actual volume and the change. And we've also developed uh, this interactive uh, widget to show streetcar speeds over the corridor. Um, so showing the speeds at individual sections and then the total travel time from one end of the corridor to another. And this will also show by month and then uh, between the AM and the PM peak. And these components were coded in uh, D3, um, but for those of you who are particularly interested, we just uh, tried to make them work within Dash, and so we had to first take the D3 and make that work within React, and then take the React and make that work within Dash. The React to Dash piece wasn't that hard, the D3 to React is particularly challenging. And Jesse will <laughs> wrap it up with our actual final thoughts. Great. So a few themes I hope you can take from this is that, you know, number one, I don't think any any of this would have been possible without having internal capability. Um, so you know, if you go back to the timelines of, of when we did this, uh, city council made the decision in early July to go forward with the pilot project. Um, so we. The pilot project launched in early November, uh, so there's just a couple months in there, and you know it's just not possible to go through procurement processes and whatever you would need to do to do this anyway, other than using internal resources. Um, there still was procurement pieces that we had to jump through hoops on, obviously, to you know buy this uh, equipment and get it installed in the streets and so on. Um, but yeah, if you learn a lot about various things like traffic poles. So if you need to know anything about traffic poles, I'm your guy. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of traffic poles. <laughs> um, so that's this really the second second bullet here though is that like in-house data capability really opens doors. And you know, I can't stress that enough. Uh, the other the other thing is is this idea of moving away from from these like really random snapshots of, of information to actually building, you know permanent and pervasive data collection techniques. You know, one of the things that we haven't really had as transportation engineers and planners is this sort of count data that's coming in from these cameras, like 24-7, 365. And you know, some some really important kind of pet projects in there is that, you know, there has always been some, you know, if you're a transportation nerd, you, you know this stuff, but like, you know, there's always been some technologies that you can use to count cars that you can put out there that'll count cars all the time. But it's, it's really game changing when you're able to use technology that's also counting pedestrians and also counting bicycles. And you know, to, do that, to do that downtown without counting those users is, is, is really disingenuous. So, so the technology's really opened up those doors and so we're really excited to have that. Um, third point is just being open and transparent with, their, with the analysis and with you know, how we're looking at the data and sharing it with everyone. And 
uh, you know, from our perspective, there is a lot of new technologies that are out there that, that can really help us understand cities better. You know, it's the whole smart cities movement in some ways, and we're, you know, doing a lot of that, you know, on the fly. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity to actually, you know, use this technology to change how we uh, build and design our cities. So thank you. Glad to field some questions about King Street.